I'm a 22 year old male who happened to end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. My best friend lived in a city close enough to where I live, so I used to visit her a lot during the week, when I had time off from work. This one evening, I left her house quite late, so I was pretty tired when I set off. Probably shouldn't have set off driving in the first place with me being so fatigued. Nonetheless, I set off home. Majority of the journey is on the motorway. About 10 minutes into the journey, I can feel my eyes rolling into the back of my head. I needed to stop. I came off the motorway at the next exit and tried to find somewhere to pull over, to possibly have a nap or just a little rest. I eventually came across a little side road along a country road. This road was plunged into darkness, with wooded areas on either side. With some places on either side of the road to pull up, there was some other cars parked here too, and a lorry. So I figured this would be a good place to stop and have a rest. So I did exactly that. I pulled my car to the side of this uneven road surface and came to a stop. Turned off my engine and made sure that the doors were locked. Not long after I pulled up and reclined my seat, there were a few cars pulling up near me, stopping and then driving off again, only to return a few minutes later. I am a car enthusiast, so I know my cars, even from just the shape of their headlights so I could tell it was the same cars arriving and leaving constantly. I was getting a bit on edge, but I was that tired and I just tried to ignore them. I closed my eyes after about five minutes of me laying there in my car. I heard a car door open and then close. The obvious sounds of someone getting out of the car and I opened my eyes and I glanced out of my window. But because there was no street lights on the side of the road, all I could see was the silhouette of the cars parked near me. It was also silent on this road so the sound of the car door was instantly jarring. However, after hearing the car door, nothing followed for a few moments. So again, I closed my eyes and tried to nap once again, but then I heard the unsettling sound of someone's footsteps on gravel. Like I said, this road was silent, so this was an undeniable sound. The footsteps seemed to be getting louder and closer. I once again opened my eyes to see the horrifying silhouette of someone slowly approaching my car to the driver's side. My heart instantly began racing. I wrapped my hand around my keys, which were still dangling in the ignition slot, but I was frozen in place. I did not have the ability to sit up, start my engine, and race away. The person got closer and closer to my car, so I did what I thought at the time was the best idea. I turned my head away from the window and pretended to be asleep. This person got next to my car and I heard the footsteps get closer, then stopped for a moment. Then my worst fear in that situation happened. I heard them try to open my door handle a few times and then they made their way around the back of my car and tried to open the boot to no avail. Then they made their way to my passenger side, which was the side of my head was facing, and I was certain they could not see inside of my car, but I still opened my eyes the slightest bit to see what was going on. All I could see was this man dressed in black with a hood up and one hand in his pants, the other one trying my passenger door. I laid still with my eyes half closed trying to fathom what was going on. After a few more tries with my door handle, he did another walk around my car. I could see him walk past my car, brushing himself against my door as he walked past. He then stopped for a second. I thought he was going to walk away, but he instead began knocking on my window. He did this three times, and my heart began racing even faster as I lied there trying to pretend to be asleep. I was certain he was going to try and smash my windows to get in. But to my surprise, he just walked away and got back in his car. He turned his headlights on and I realized it was one of the cars that was driving up and down the road earlier on. He angled his headlights directly at my car and into my windscreen, so I threw myself back down and pretended to be asleep once again. I heard his car set off and very slowly drive past mine, almost stopping when he got next to me. This whole experience filled me with fear and adrenaline to the point of being wide awake, and as soon as I saw his car disappear, I turned on my ignition and got the freak out of there. I drove straight home and had the most restless night of sleep ever. I will never drive near that road again, even during the day. If you're tired and need to drive somewhere, don't, or at least stop at a service station that's well lit. And please, lock your car doors. It was the mid-1980s and the town that I live in is Canada. I worked for a reputable hotel chain at night for maid service. 
I would clean late checkouts, tend to customer requests, and talk to the people at the front desk. We also had what they called day rates, which were for ladies who would only stay an hour with a friend, to put it nicely. It was Thursday evening, and I had two day rates and two late checkouts to clean. So, I went about my business. And when I got to my second room, I knocked on the door. Housekeeping? But there was no reply. I knocked again. Housekeeping? No reply. So then I let myself into the room, which we're allowed to do. I looked around the room and I noticed that there were a few personal items still left, but the room still should have been empty two or three hours ago. I noticed the bathroom door was closed, and I started getting a funny feeling in my stomach. I went to the bathroom door and knocked. Housekeeping, I announced, and again. Knock, knock. Housekeeping. No reply. For some reason, my stomach just did not feel right. Slowly, I opened the bathroom door and peeked in. Shower curtain was closed, and since I watch a lot of scary movies, I was frightened now. I did not want to step into the bathroom, so I grabbed the room and used a handle to slowly open the curtain. There was a lady in the bathtub full of water and cigarette butts in the water and a bottle of vodka on the side of the bathtub. I called, Miss? Miss? Hello, Miss? But there was no response. She didn't even flinch. I called her again very loudly, but still, nothing. So I poked her with the broom handle on her shoulder and her head just fell to the side. I ran out of the room so fast and down to the front desk, where I told the clerk what I had found. He got the night porter to go to the room and check it out. A few moments later, I overheard the walkie-talkie. You better call 911. This lady's deceased. I nearly hit the floor. As you can imagine, I had to go home after and couldn't finish my duties. I just could not stop shaking. A few days later, I had to call my boss and tell her that there was no way that I could come back to work there. She understood and said that she would forward my last check and give me a good reference. Now, let me take you to 1992, seven years after my hotel horror. I found myself working at another reputable hotel chain in a different city, this time as the front desk clerk. I was doing my night audit, so there was only three employees in the whole building between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. On this particular night, the night porter had called in sick, so it was just myself and the security guard. The hotel was almost at capacity as there was sports teams of young age kids in competition for the week. There were two rooms that had checked out a day before, but they had them reserved so it was up to me to clean the rooms as we needed them first thing in the morning. I went to the hall closet, got the maid's card, and pushed it down the hall to the first room. There had been an elderly couple staying in that room, so it was quite tidy, and it took me less than 15 minutes to clean it. I took a short break and then headed back upstairs to clean the second room. I didn't even knock on the door because no one should have been in there as the gentleman had already checked out. I went in, stripped the bed, got the garbage, pulled the vacuum cleaner out, dusted, put the bed together, and then I headed to the bathroom. And the door was closed. I just stood there, looking at the door, listening to see if I could hear anything. I heard nothing and I giggled to myself. I opened the door and the shower curtain was closed. As I said before, I watch a lot of scary movies, so I started to get nervous. I took a deep breath, stood up tall, walked into the bathroom, and flung open the shower curtain. And then I screamed, really loudly. There was a woman in the water, with a bottle of booze on the side of the tub. 
as soon as I saw a man's tie around her throat. I closed my eyes, backed out of the room, and closed the door. Slowly, I just walked down to the front desk. I couldn't believe what had just happened, and I called the police to come and take care of it. The security guard stayed with me for the remainder of the four hours. The room didn't get completely cleaned, and that day I quit my job at another hotel horror. This is a true story, and I never worked at a hotel again. I have a teacher at school that teaches a variety of subjects, and he is generally well-liked. The only strange thing about him is that he doesn't call any student by their real names, but by their future potential from his opinion. He comes in class and starts doing the register. Potential murderer, teacher shouts out to Callum and he raises his hand, as he knows it's him because the teacher always calls him by that name. Potential burglar, teacher shouts out to Brian who puts up his hand and because he's always been called that name by the teacher. Potential psychopath. Teacher shouts out and Emily puts up her hand, as she knows it's her because the teacher always calls her that. Potential cannibal. And now I put up my hand, because he always calls me that. He has something for everyone, from potential freak accident to potential evil genius. I admit it was fun at first, but... Now I just want him to call me by my real name, which is Joshua. On another day, our teacher starts doing the register and he usually calls everyone by their potential and not their real names. But then he calls on Callum by his real name. We all were shocked. I asked Callum why our teacher didn't call Callum potential murderer anymore. Callum told me that the real reason our teacher doesn't call him potential murderer anymore is because it's not potential anymore. It's real. Callum actually murdered someone. He murdered some homeless man because he knew it would make the teacher call him by his real name. Callum then told me to take a bite out of a dead man by ripping some of his flesh out and cooking it as it was the only way to make the teacher call me by my real name. I took a chunk out of the dead guy, and he hadn't been dead for very long. I cooked it and ate it. The next day for register, my teacher called me Joshua because I'm not a potential cannibal anymore, but a real one. Mommy, mommy, why can't we leave Ray? My children tell me all the time, and Ray is physically abusive, and being the stepfather to my children, he's dangerous to be around. He is a steroid junkie who likes to build his body, and he's hit me and the kids many times. Yes, he leaves bruises and marks, but they only can heal when Ray is in a good mood. When Ray is in a good mood, Everything is fantastic. When Ray is not in a good mood, then everything is hell and like a storm. He destroys things. We should leave, but I don't. I remember taking the kids and leaving Ray, but the bruises and cuts weren't healing and becoming worse. Even septic. It's only when Ray found us and was in a good mood that our cuts and bruises had healed instantly right in front of our eyes. It felt good, and I remember running away from Ray another time with no cuts and bruises, though. And I started to miss Ray's good moods. When Ray is in a good mood, everything is amazing, and life goes exactly the way that I want it. So everything started again at box one, and Ray is simply Ray. Some people pay Ray to hurt them when he is in a bad mood, and then to heal them when he is in a good mood. They are addicted to Ray's good moods, and everyone wants Ray to be in a good mood. I remember when Ray was in a bad mood and had beaten up both my kids. 
and they were crying and begging me to take them away from Ray. Then Ray suddenly turned to a good mood and their bruises and cuts had healed. Then my kids loved Ray again. And this is a good life when Ray is in a good mood and nothing can go wrong. But then Ray killed our dog in rage. We still kept the body of the dog. So when Ray was in a good mood, the dog came back to life. Only for when Ray's in a good mood and when the good mood stops, the dog will go back to being dead. I remember once when Ray hurt my children again and their cuts and bruises weren't healing because Ray was in a bad mood for a long time. I thought they were going to die, but luckily he got into a good mood and they healed. This year, I have only been experiencing Ray in good moods and never the bad. Only my kids were experiencing his bad sides. Then my eldest child said to me, Mommy, just like the dead dog, you only open your eyes when Ray is in a good mood. My child is frightened of ghosts, and I have been constantly helping my child to get over her fears, but it has been a struggle. The trials a child must go through in life and all the fears, anxiety, and trepidation they must face is daunting. As a responsible parent, I have been doing my best to show my daughter that ghosts don't exist and I have taken many steps to assure that ghosts don't exist. I myself used to be scared of ghosts as a child, but my father helped me through it all and I will do the same for my daughter. In our family, there's a tradition that we do when one of our members is scared of ghosts. And so, I call all of our extended family and neighborhood friends to come to my house. The main event was going to be about my daughter realizing that ghosts don't exist, and it will be nice for everyone to be together as it has been a long time. My daughter was terrified and even more anxious as we are going to be the main attraction. But I told her that after the event, she will no longer be scared of ghosts. Then when the day arrived and all the guests gathered around the house, with a man tied up to a chair, my daughter was in the middle. The man tied up to the chair was killed and as he died, I told my daughter, observe the man dying his body and see if there's any spirit that comes out of him. And my daughter just stared at the man with wide eyes. For hours, we all just stared at the dead body, as we were all witnessing no kind of spirit come from the man's body. There was a lesson from my daughter and a reminder to everyone else in the room that ghosts or spirits don't exist. Then, on another night, my daughter got scared again and killed her cat. She looked at me and said, I just wanted to remind myself that ghosts or spirits don't exist. My sister and I decided we were going out for the night, have some drinks and relax. We found a place, had a great time, as the night came to an end. We decided we wanted to stop at a gas station to use the bathroom and get something to drink. As we pulled into the parking lot, we saw a few cars there, and the gas station attendant standing in front telling people he was closed. It was about 3 a.m., and this was sad but expected. We quickly pulled out and headed on our way. Another car that had been parked pulled out behind us. We laughed and said, well, I guess he gets it too. It was probably about five miles down the road, and we realized someone was tailgating us. My sister decided to floor it, and the car behind us did the same. We didn't think much, just called the guy an asshole and kept going. We were now paying attention and decided we were going to take a different route. The car did the same, maintaining a high speed and continuing to tailgate us. I told my sister to fake a turn and see if they'll pass us. She gets in the turn lane and so did the car. We contemplated for a moment and I told her to floor it. At this point, we were freaking out. I told her, get on the highway 
and let loose on this person. We got on the highway and they were right there. We are going about 120 plus miles per hour and this car was doing the same sticking with us. If we changed lanes, they did. She brake checked him and it still didn't deter him. As we were hoping a cop would magically show up, we decided to go to the fire department as it was closer than the police station. At this point, the person's been following us for almost an hour. I don't know why we didn't call 911. It just never came to mind. We got off at an exit, blue red lights, and still hoping a cop would come out of nowhere to no avail. We make it to the fire station and the car pulls up behind us. At this point, I'm enraged. How dare this person do this to us? I'm stupidly filled with liquid courage and adrenaline. Jump out of my sister's car and haul ass to the person's car. I demanded to know what he thought he was doing and why he did what he did. I made sure to yell hoping to stir some firemen. It was a middle-aged man in his late 40s and early 50s. Gray hair, cleanly shaven and alone. He started stuttering and said, I was just scared. I was scared. I saw you girls at the gas station and how quickly you pulled out. You just looked safe to me. At this point, I was completely bewildered. He went on to say how he was homeless and new to the area and pulled the good Christian act. After some of his lies, we simply told him to park where he was and then gave him names of churches and places for him to stay. We then left and he didn't follow us. We made it home completely weirded out. He gave us his real name and we decided to look it up. He had lied about everything. He had lived in the area his whole life. He had a job and a home. I still do not know what he wanted that night. I don't know if he thought we were easy targets for trafficking or to rob. Thankfully, we didn't find out what his true intentions were. Morning, Dad. The little girl sounded so excited. Gently, I explained that she had the wrong number. Nuh-uh. Was all she said before hanging up. I set the phone on the desk, half chuckling. Three days later, the phone buzzed again. With my free hand, I answered while my wife, Alex, held onto the toilet seat for dear life. Hi, Dad. The girl yelled, her voice bursting with joy. Like before, I explained that she must have gotten the numbers mixed up. You are my dad, silly. She said, like this was a game. Tell mommy, I hope that she feels better soon. Vomit began spewing into the toilet bowl before I could press the girl about how she knew my wife had morning sickness. And later, when I tried to call back, I only got a dead tone. Is Freddy gonna be okay? She asked next time that she called, while I was giving our golden retriever his antibiotics. I swallowed a gulp. Yeah... Uh, the ear medicine's gonna make Freddy all better. What's your name, sweetheart? I forgot. Now I wasn't laughing. This girl knew everything about us. In another few weeks, right about Alex's due date, the mystery girl called yet again. Tell mommy that I'm super duper excited to meet her. I said, tell me, pet, where are you calling from? The other place? Where's that? I don't know. Well, how'd you get there? I was in a puddle, and it was cold, and I was crying. And then I woke up here. And what does the other place look like? All black and squiggly. And are you alone? Is there anybody else there with you? Only Mr. Bones. Who's Mr. Bones? He's like a bloody skeleton with a creepy smile, except scary. Is he there with you now? No. He kept laughing about how he wants to hurt people, so I ran until I got warm and then I saw you clipping Freddy's nails. That's how I knew you'd be a good daddy. So I stayed here. I can't wait to meet you and Mommy and Freddy. I swallowed a gulp. I'm not saying I believed in reincarnation, but I almost did. But really, would it be so terrible if this all turned out to be true? There's something beautiful about our children choosing us. 
My daughter was born seven pounds and two ounces, in a delivery room that went about as smoothly as you can reasonably hope for. Back home, as I watched her dream in her cradle, I wondered what might happen when she grew up. Would she recall echoes of our past conversations? Would she still have the same innocent voice? Imagine my surprise when the girl called again later, that very same night. She was hysterical, so I begged her to calm down and explain what had happened. He tricked me. Who did? I asked, confused. Mr. Bones. He knew where I was. Sweetheart, don't panic. I I'm sure it's going to be okay. No, it's not. Why not? Because he's the one who got to be born. <laughs>